Kieran Sali was introduced in the second edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, where her character originally emerged from the Greyhawk world setting. There, Kieran Sali was once a beloved queen, possessing a grace that captivated the elven people of a land named Threnody. From an early age, Kieran Sali exhibited a natural proficiency for the arcane arts, but she was left unsatisfied with the more traditional, nature-born magic of her people. Inside her lurked a far darker curiosity, a fascination with the ability to infuse unholy energies into the lifeless. Kieran Sali routinely found solace in the forbidden dark echoes that spoke of life beyond death. She delved into tomes bound in flesh, their pages filled with secrets most would find best left forgotten. For many years, she practiced her unholy experiments in secret, her skill in necromancy growing with each passing night. The dead whispered their secrets to her, and she listened, enthralled by the power they promised. The Kingdom of Threnody thrived under the rule of her husband, the King, a name now lost to the winds of countless millennia. Initially, he was unaware of the evil festering within his queen, yet in time, as her acts grew more profane, the murmurs of her unholy deeds began to spread among the people of his elven kingdom. Rumors began to circulate of gruesome horrors digging up the dead in the black of night, their lumbering shadows carrying lifeless corpses into the castle's dungeon depths. The once adoring populace now grew uneasy, their reverence now turning to fear and disgust. Undeterred, driven by this forbidden obsession, Kieran Sali continued her descent into the taboo, continuing to raise undead minions in even larger numbers, ghastly beings bound to her will. She found their company far more appealing than the living, and they carried out her bidding with a silent efficiency. Each night, they would tear through the earthen soil of Threnody's graveyards to defile the dead, their skeletal hands prying open coffins to retrieve the decayed reagents within. Over time, the necromancer queen, no longer satisfied with the long dead, would add outright murder to her list of foul deeds. The fresh blood of innocence now fueling her growing powers, their lives extinguished, their souls enslaved to satisfy her dark ambitions. Each unspeakable act was another stepping stone in Kieran Sali's morbid desire for mastery of the darkest of arts. The king, upon confirming her role in these unholy practices, could not ignore the horrors she wrought despite the love he held for his queen. Torn between his love and duty, he found he could not bear to kill her, yet knew she must be stopped. And so he made the decision to forever banish his dark elven queen, Kieran Sali. With a small contingent of her loyalist followers, she was exiled from Threnody, from her home. In exile, Kieran Sali's fury and a thirst for revenge only burned hotter. For countless decades, she continued to hone her necromantic arts, her mastery growing with each passing year. She soon unlocked even darker necromancy, graduating from the mindless skeletal and zombie minions to far more powerful forces of undeath. Ghouls and whites found themselves bound to her will, eventually mastering the secrets of the damned, chaining the will of wraiths, shadows, and banshees to her command. And so it was, nearly one century after her exile, the dark elf necromancer queen Kieran Sali raised a mighty army of undeath and marched upon Threnody, her harrowing homecoming of vengeance. Exacting retribution, her undead army swept through the land like a plague, leaving a crimson trail of death and despair in their wake. She took a perverse delight in the suffering she caused, her cruelty unbound as she methodically slaughtered or enslaved every living soul in Threnody, saving her king for the finality of her vengeance. She compelled her former love to watch the terrors as they unfold, bound and helpless as his kingdom fell to undead ruin. The tormented screams of his people echoed in his ears while their blood stained the ground he once walked. Kiran Sali reveled in his despair, her heart now as cold as the grave. When the desecrated land fell silent but for the shuffling of dead risen to serve, the Revenancer, as she came to be known, finally turned her gaze upon the king, taking the greatest pleasure in his slow, tormented demise and intoxication like no other. 
her retribution enacted, the once thriving kingdom and the small world upon which it sat was reduced to a lifeless husk. Threnody was forevermore a dead realm devoid of all but despair. The malevolent evils of the multiverse taking notice of her acts soon deified Kiran Sali as a lesser goddess of death and vengeance. However, her vile deeds also caught the attention of the good and just forces of the cosmos, namely the Elven Pantheon. Her vengeance upon Threnody now complete, her soul now forever stained with the genocide of an entire world, Kiran Sali retreated into the abyss to escape their wrath and find her place among the demon lords and impious powers within its depths. The Seldarin had named her Drow, a curse disguised as a word, but to the newly deified goddess, their petty pronouncements held no power in the infinite layers of chaos. There, in that sea of evil, the vengeful banshee would continue her dark work, her as a name revered only by the dead and the most malevolent of beings, seeking their own warped desire for vengeance and the forever dark blessing of unlife. Kiran Sali emerged from her mortal shackles as the drow deity of vengeance and the undead, called upon by those who seek retribution, mastery of dark arts, or an extended unlife. Her portfolio encompasses two primary domains, vengeance and death, or undeath if you prefer. And these powerful domains shape the vast majority of her interactions, from the religious dogma she demands of her followers, to her own selfish motivations and ambitions. Vengeance is a concept already deeply ingrained in drought culture, and the vengeful banshee embodies the relentless, even irrational pursuit of retribution for any perceived wrongs, and her callous nature provides no forgiveness, only an intense desire to inflict suffering upon those who have crossed her. This thirst for vengeance, one that crosses into obsession and madness, is a driving force that extends to her followers, many of which are often driven by their own experiences of betrayal and injustice, and find solace and purpose in her teachings. They see the vengeful banshee as a champion of their grievances, understanding she is a cruel goddess, but one who also understands their pain and offers a path towards retribution. Kiran Sali's influence encourages them to embrace their darker impulses to seek vengeance against those who have wronged them, perpetuating a cycle of violence and retribution that so clearly defines her domain. Equally important to the dogma of Kiran Sali is the domain of death, where the Lady of the Dead's control is absolute and her mastery of necromancy is rivaled by few. Even as a mortal, the Necromancer Queen was a formidable force in the dark arts of the undead. Upon ascending to godhood, her necromantic abilities expanded to a scale beyond mortal ability, and her command of undead with a mere thought presents a potent and terrifying portfolio. According to her doctrine, death is not an end but a transformation, a passage into a new form of existence under her rule. Lady of the Dead's followers believe that death serves as a gateway to glory in her servitude, a state in which they will each rise to serve her loyally and eternally. And this is about as good a place as any to note that all of the origin covered in that first chapter transpired in that Greyhawk age during a time dated many millennia before Araushni, the Dark Elf spinner of fates that would herself be cast out of Arvindor and arrive upon the Abyss as Lolf. We know that Kiran Sali existed in and even ruled an abyssal domain in those earliest years for centuries or perhaps millennia before she would ever come to encounter the Dark Elf Araushni now transformed into the spider demon, Lolth. And of course, we also know that at a much later date, Kiran Sali would be subjugated by and fall under the rule of Lolth as a compelled but unwilling vassal, as I've covered in Volume 8 on my series on the History of the Forgotten Realms, links below. And it is after her defeat at the hands of the Spider Queen where we continue with the known lore on the drow goddess of vengeance and death. The Dark Goddess is known by many titles. These include the Lady of the Dead, the Revenancer, the Vengeful Banshee, and one of the more obscure and unflattering of aliases, the Pitiless Dowager. And it is that last title that I find most interesting because it brings up a point of contention in the appearance of Kiran Sali. Of course, Dowager is another word for Old Woman, Matron, or even Crone. Yet the written lore seems to provide a wide array of adjectives to describe the visual appeal of the Dark Goddess, ranging from beautiful and alluring to wretched and horrifying. 
To be clear, I would actually not classify these as conflicts any more than I would for Lolf or really any other deity, as we can pretty confidently assume that they can change their appearance to suit any situation or mood. That said, I've chosen to provide a mix of various looks for the Lady of the Dead, ranging from one extreme of beauty, like this, to the more unsettling, even horrifying looks in her near lich-like form. In my own head canon, this is closer to her natural or true form and probably a bit more rare. You know, when she's exceptionally angry or just having one of those bad hair days. I will also mention here that the 5th edition resource Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes briefly mentions that some legends also portray Kiran Sali in the form of a banshee. I had not found that anywhere else in the lore, but it's worth mentioning if only for the sake of completeness. Nonetheless, despite the various depictions of her physical form, beauty or lack thereof, Kiran Sali is typically described as lithe, slender, or sinuous in form and her drow heritage, evident in her features, is mostly consistent in the lore. Her skin ranging from the dark gray to obsidian black, hair of silver, and an array of eye colors ranging from pale white and amber to the violet eyes of the Illithir, and likely the most prevalent, the red eyes more common to the drow in their post-descent to the Underdark. While her inherent dark elf traits are most familiar and common among the drow, her attire and adornment are one aspect of her appearance that is quite unique. She is often depicted wearing what I would call funeral garb, which is certainly most thematic considering the domains in her control. Black flowing, loose-fitting, almost ethereal lace dresses, and black or silver silken veils. The styles certainly vary, but she's almost always outfitted in some form of black. Another hallmark of her visuals would be her preference of wearing silver jewelry, and lots of it, often in the form of, but certainly not limited to, numerous rings. The Dark Goddess's penchant for silver rings and jewelry is further exemplified in her best-known religious symbol, the female drow hand, adorned with those silver rings. Beyond her attire, there are many other artifacts associated with the Lady of the Dead, but the two most unmistakable are her dagger named Coldheart, and the Mantle of Nightmares. Her dagger is a long, curved blade perpetually dripping venomous poison. She also has in her possession a cloak made of bones, known as the Mantle of Nightmares. This gruesome garment is said to induce fear in those who hear its death rattle. But all this talk of her physical appearance is likely a moot point for most, because Kiran Sali only rarely reveals herself in her drow humanoid form to mortals. That is not to say the Revenancer does not make her appearance known, quite the contrary. However, she most often does so through the use of one of three alternative manifestations that are well documented in the lore. In her first manifestation, Kiran Sali simply makes a skull rise into the air, to about eye level, and then spin rapidly. When the skull stops, a female drow face will form onto the skull and either speak a message or if you've really upset the Dark Goddess, the face will wail, causing pain or death to those near enough to hear it. The second of her preferred manifestations is by way of a dry, chuckling laughter that occupies the mind of her target. This laughter causes fear and a feeling of uneasiness in those who hear it. But it is Kiran Sali's last manifestation that is her most deadly. Two skeletal hands will burst from the ground, directly beneath her intended target and proceed to drag the victim down into the earth. If the Lady of Dead is feeling generous, the target may only be held underground for a short amount of time to ensure the message is received. However, if you have summoned the ire of the Death Goddess, or if she harbors ill will towards you in any manner, then this may be the manner by which you die, as Kiran Sali will simply leave you captive and forget all about you. Kiran Sali holds a relatively small but devoted following that practice their faith in secrecy and isolation, most prevalent in the Underdark. Her faith consists mostly of female drow seeking vengeance, power over the dark arts, or an extended existence beyond death. Kiran Sali's dogma revolves around the belief that life itself is a crime deserving punishment, and the view of death and undeath as tools to be wielded in their own quest for power and a forever state of unlife. Many of her followers have found their way to the Lady of the Dead after becoming unsatisfied or disillusioned with the goddess Lolf. 
but to become a follower of Kiran Sali is to embrace a life of persecution and secrecy. This stems from their blasphemous worship in the shadow of Lolth as the primary goddess and religious faith of the drow. In the heart of drow cities dedicated to Lolth, Kiran Sali's followers worship in shadows and silent rebellion, performing their rites and rituals unseen and away from the eyes of the Spider Queen's far larger following. These shrines often take the form of black marble sarcophagi adorned with carvings depicting the dead rising to exact vengeance upon the living. It is here in the stillness of these hidden chambers that Kiran Sali's followers can venerate her without fear of reprisal, with her most powerful clergy performing a ritual of prayer by lying within the sarcophagi while clutching her holy symbol. Legends tell us that if a living priestess is disturbed while in this state of reverie, Kiran Sali will grant her the powers of a vampire for the next 24 hours, allowing her to unleash swift and terrible vengeance and retribution on those who dare defile her sanctuary. While much of her following exists in the forever night of the Underdark, her presence can also be found on the surface of Faerun. Some of her high-ranked followers are known to have joined the Cult of the Dragon as Wearers of Purple, a title within the cult further signifying their leadership this elevated status allowing them to extend Kiran Sali's influence onto the surface world. But Kiran Sali's faith finds its most potent expression in the Acropolis of Thanatos. Found in the upper Underdark and under the Galena Mountains, northeast of the massive subterranean lake called the Moon Deep Sea, which lies within the Underdark Cavern, known as the Vault of Gnashing Teeth. The temple's black marble structure is adorned with unholy sculptures and murals, Within its walls, priestesses of Kiran Sali practice their profane rituals, raise armies of the dead, and plot their vengeance against those who have wronged them. The Acropolis serves as a central hub for followers of the Lady of the Dead, a place where they can gather in secrecy, share knowledge, and plan their next moves. The temple's strategic location beneath the Galena Mountains allows her forces to launch attacks onto the surface world, targeting those who oppose their goddess. The temple itself stands in the center of the ruins of Veldrinshar, the city's name meaning concealed mine, hence at its secluded nature. Once a thriving drow city dedicated to Lolth, it fell victim to a plague falling abandoned in 1278 Dale Reckoning. For a decade, the city lay silent until a band of Durgar raided its remains, leaving it a desolate ruin. Then, in 1337 Dale Reckoning, Lorinda Talina, a priestess of Kiran Sali, claimed the ruins for her goddess, establishing the Acropolis of Thanatos as the primary temple of the Revenancer. The Acropolis is probably best known as the principal location of the Legion of Vengeful Banshees, the most prominent of unholy orders under Kiran Sali's religious influence. These fundamentalist Banshee Knights are fanatically devoted to their dark goddess and the destruction of the undead Tanari servants of Orcus. They tirelessly launch crusades across Faerun and into the Abyss and will stop at nothing short of achieving vengeance over Orcus on behalf of the vengeful Banshee. Their animus and even name stemming from the Lady of the Dead's invasion into the realm of Thanatos as I've well documented in a separate video, links below. Another notable temple dedicated to Kiran Sali is the Undying Temple, a sentient structure summoned by Irei Tassarin, another powerful priestess of Kiran Sali. Located within Castle Mera Midra, the Undying Temple's unique architecture featuring a floating orb of negative energy and magically enhanced walls make it a formidable stronghold. The Undying Temple's sentience allows it to actively defend itself and its inhabitants making it a powerful asset in Kiran Sali's ongoing struggle for religious dominance. The temples of Kiran Sali, whether hidden shrines or grand complexes of sentience, serve as more than just places of worship. They are bastions of her vengeance, where the dead are revered and the living are manipulated to serve the goddess's dark designs. All followers of the Revenancer are expected to live by a strict set of principles that guide their every action. The first of two primary tenets is the pursuit of vengeance, where the devout are expected to answer any offense, real or imagined, with swift and brutal reprisals. No slight is too small to be forgotten, and no transgression is too great to be avenged. Forgiveness is simply not allowed under any circumstance. 
The second tenet, as you can probably guess, revolves around the control and manipulation of the undead. The faithful believe that true power lies in the unquestioning servitude of those who have crossed the threshold of death. They see the undead not as abominations, but as instruments to be used in their quest for power and vengeance. Kiron Sali's clergy are known as the Crones of Thanatos, and are primarily composed of female drow necromancers, both living and undead, who serve their goddess with absolute devotion. The Crones are highly skilled practitioners of the dark arts, their expertise in manipulating the forces of life and death aligning perfectly with their goddess's portfolio and using their powers to raise armies of undead to serve their goddess and enact their vengeful schemes. Within this system of clergy, there does exist a clear hierarchy. Novices are called the commanded, while more experienced members are known as night hags, but to be clear, are not actual night hags. I should point out here that while her theological base is dominated by female members, it is not forbidden for males to follow the Lady of the Dead. Uncommon, perhaps even rare, but they do exist, especially among her Banshee Knight ranks. At the apex of this hierarchy reside the powerful but most disturbing Yathrenshi as the leading clergy within the Church of Kiaran Sali. This most elite of her ranked followers are comprised exclusively of female drow, and each almost universally came to her dark faith as accomplished high-level wizards and warlocks in their own right, having already achieved mastery over the arcane, and now, through rigorous study, training, and dark powers bestowed them from the Lady of the Dead, have also mastered the art of necromancy. Yathra and she are a very dangerous lot, their mastery of the magics of life and death granting them significant advantages in combat. For example, a Yathra and she can instantly reanimate any creature they kill as a zombie under their control. The Yathrenshi's formidable powers culminate in two more terrifying and exclusive powers granted by the Vengeful Banshee. The first is called Keening, which is similar to a Banshee's whale and capable of killing a multitude of creatures within a 30-foot radius. Additionally, these highest-ranking clerics are also taught a spell called Threnody. This takes the form of a lamenting song able to conjure disturbing images of deceased relatives in the minds of their enemies. This effect is particularly powerful if the Yathrin she is in command of undead with a personal connection to their foe. Upon death, loyal followers of Kiran Sali are often granted the Lady of the Dead's gift in the form of their own undeath, their souls now bound to her service in the afterlife. This transformation can take many forms, from mindless undead thralls to powerful banshees or revenants, depending upon the individual's devotion and the goddess's favor. Those deemed especially worthy might even be transformed into an empowered form of banshee called Kiranshi. These favored banshees retain all of their advanced spellcasting abilities in this unlife, becoming most formidable instruments of the dark drought goddess's will. Up note here is the fact that the Lady of the Dead rarely, if ever, grants lichdom to her followers. While the lore does not explicitly state she cannot or will not, there exists no historical accounts of her ever bestowing lichdom, as the vengeful banshee generally prefers to grant her dark gifts of unlife in the form of revenants, banshees, or for those most loyal of her servants, her greatest gift, a form in her own image, the empowered banshee-like Kiran Shees. Among the many practices and ceremonies of her clergy, the ritual that most accurately embodies everything that Kiran Sali stands for can be found in an annual unholy day called the Grave Rending. Taking place on Midwinter Eve each year, the Grave Rending is a single-day ritual observed by followers of the Dark Goddess and is intended as a form of reverence for the undead. During the Grave Rending, each of her clergy, as well as her followers with necromantic skills, will push their dark powers to their limits, animating as many undead as they are able to control. These undead, known as Vengeance Hunters, are then imbued with an unlife and an impious drive to achieve a singular purpose, find and seek revenge against those that killed them. Empowered to relentlessly pursue their quarry and attain their own form of undead vengeance, they are gifted this unlife for exactly 24 hours. If a vengeance hunter is destroyed, it does not rise again. 
and after 24 hours have elapsed or they have achieved their revenge, these undead vengeance hunters simply return to their graves in what must be a harrowing sight. Now, you would be forgiven for thinking that the grave rending would be the darkest of practices for the crones of Thanatos, but you would be wrong. For those that watched Volume 8 of the Forgotten Realms history series, you'll recall my laments as to why Kiran Sali, such an interesting and underused deity, was not given more love in these later versions of the game. I speculated then that this was most likely due to her Greyhawk origins. And while I still think that is true to some degree, in my research and discovery for this volume, we really need to look no further than the Yathrin Shi for some of the strongest evidence as to why the later editions of the lore have shunned the Dark Goddess. As the highest ranking clergy of her order, bestowed with great powers from their goddess, the Yathrin Shi have demands placed upon them as a prerequisite in order to achieve that lofty status, title, and granted powers. While this of course includes their magical prowess, it also includes the routine and ritual undertaking of some disturbing acts that involve the undead. The third edition Book of Vile Darkness actually has a word for this. They call it a feat named Lich Love. <laughs> I'm going to leave it right there and suffice it to say that Yathra and she are most likely big fans of Cannibal Corpse. Now moving quickly away from that lovely detour, we find ourselves headed directly into another lore pothole but I would be remiss if I were not to at least mention another of the more unsavory aspects of Kiran Sali's dogma, specifically her association to the, let's call it the trade of indentured servitude of the Dark Elf Drow. Kiran Sali is described as a divine sponsor of this heinous practice, with her followers often engaging in the worst aspects of such enslavement. And there exist gruesome accounts of ruthlessly working these Drow Elves to death, only to then raise the fallen to continue their service of hard labor. I will point out, however, that I found this connection primarily in sources originating from the Greyhawk setting, where the goddess's name was slightly altered to replace the double E with an I, which I also learned in my research the lore describes as a forced change placed upon the Revenancer by Lolf as a symbol of her subjugation. While Kiran Sali is most certainly capable of great cruelty, she also exhibits surprising tenderness towards her undead servants and minions, the grave-rending ritual holiday we just discussed being an excellent example of her reverence for the dead. Outside of interactions with her undead, Kiran Sali is best described as cruel, spiteful, and incessantly consumed by thoughts of vengeance. She is swift to anger and harbors grudges of the most ill intent for any perceived slights, whether real or imagined. This tendency towards vengeance stems from her many deaths and resurrections, which is also written as a catalyst for her madness. That's right, make no mistake, Kiran Sali is considered to be an insane deity. Yet, despite her madness, the Dark Goddess retains a sinister intellect, carefully scheming against those she believes to have wronged her in any way. Her insanity is best illustrated through an unrelenting obsession with those slights. She remembers every perceived insult, and will meticulously plot her revenge, going to extreme and unreasonable lengths that may be both unwarranted and irrational. This makes the vengeful Banshee a dangerous and unpredictable deity, something any adventurer should always keep top of mind and every world builder should incorporate in their efforts. Kiran Sali's relationships are even more complex, fraught with a pervasive sense of distrust. Bound to Lolth's will, the Lady of the Dead seethes with hate under the Spider Queen's rule and desires nothing more than to break free from her control, yet she is only capable of small acts of rebellion. However, that does not stop her incessant plotting for her freedom and some measure of retribution, and it is that forced subservience to Lolth that colors her interactions, with Kiran Sali constantly seeking opportunities to undermine Lolth's authority. While she has formed alliances with other deities, these are often fleeting, tenuous, and driven solely by her own agenda. In the end, Kiran Sali's loyalty remains only with herself and her own pursuits of power. As such, the Revenancer prefers to act independently of others, trusting few to carry out her will as she envisions it. This need for control is best exemplified in her preference for the company of the undead, who follow her every command without question. Still, Kiran Sali's constant pursuit of vengeance, her self-serving nature, and her favor of the undead have all earned her a host of enemies. 
Her disregard for the sanctity of life makes her a figure of fear and revulsion among many gods, and this has brought the scorn of Ilastrae, Kelimvor, and Jurgal, just to name a few. But while Loth will forever remain at the top of her hit list, at least until she's freed from the Spider Queen's clutches, the vengeful Banshee counts another among her most hated. But unlike the Spider Queen, in the case of Orcus, the Demon Prince of the Undead, Kieran Sali was able to exact her vengeance. I would be remiss if I ended our profile on Kieran Sali without touching briefly upon the Lady of the Dead's most notable act of lore, her most improbable defeat and temporary obliteration of Orcus, the Demon Prince of Undeath. Orcus is, of course, well known as the powerful Tanari Lord and ruler of the 113th Lair of the Abyss, Thanatos. But it was not always this way. Leveraging her own necromantic powers and a fateful combination of good timing and a complacent Orcus, the Lady of the Dead seized her opportunity, and for a not insignificant period of time, Kieran Sali was the undisputed ruler of Thanatos. I have an entire hour-long volume dedicated solely to this event and all of its details, so if you would like to know the full story, one that includes both Orcus's undead form as Tenembras, as well as the death of Primus and five other gods left in the wake of his reclamation of his realm, then check out the Death of Orcus video, links in the show notes, and a quick link above you right about now. What I will add here that I left out of that particular video by design is one of the first questions you might have about the Revenancer's reign on Thanatos. How long did she rule? Well, that is an excellent question, with a complicated answer, and one that scholars simply cannot agree on, even to this day. The lore gets pretty murky on the timeline, but I will share the clues and contradictions that we have, along with my own opinion, so that you may come to your own conclusions. First, we have to remember that these events take place across the timeline of the gods and cosmic powers, not on a human or even mortal scale. While the Lord does not give us all the exact dates, we can construct a rough, estimated range for Kieran Sali's reign across a timeline that spanned at least a few centuries to nearly a millennia, but even that is not without its conflicts. If you watched the Death of Orcus volume, then you know that the bulk of the lore was published in the Dead Gods Adventure Anthology, and that its events took place in 1369 Dale Reckoning. And in that adventure, it is clearly stated on page 66 that as of 1369, Orcus had been dead for centuries. This lore is further backed up on page 128 of the Fiendish Codex 1, Hordes of the Abyss, where that source again confirms that Orcus was dead for centuries by the time of his resurrection. So, just following that logic alone, Kiron Sali would have had to kill Orcus and take over Thanatos in the 11th century Dale Reckoning, at the absolute latest, so 200 plus years prior. But centuries is plural, so that vague lore allows us to posit that she may have in fact ruled for something nearing a millennia. However, we run into our first timeline conflict, and it's a major one, if we both look back at the 1980s module, The Throne of Bloodstone, and try to take that lore as canon. Spoiler alert, we shouldn't, but I'll come back to that. In The Throne of Bloodstone, we are told that its events took place in 1359, Dale Reckoning which would necessitate that Orcus would have died sometime after 1359, which is obviously a clear-cut contradiction to all the lore published after this module. I have an entire chapter, chapter 12 in the Death of Orcus video, that's dedicated to all the real-world origins for these contradictions to the story, so I won't belabor it here. But the TLDR takeaway is that TSR did a complete and full retcon on the story lore from the Throne of Bloodstone that makes the events of that module nothing more than a fever dream. So after my research, and in my opinion, the Vengeful Banshee ruled Thanatos for a minimum of five centuries. However, in the end, it really comes down to your own world and lore building preferences. Either way, when looking back at Kieran Sali, I cannot help but feel like she has continually been given the short end of most lore, always defeated, subjugated, and certainly overshadowed in the drow pantheon by the lore-dominating presence and popularity of the Queen of Spiders, Lolth. But the Lady of the Dead is worthy of inclusion in your future campaigns and stories, and is not the perennial loser she's sometimes made out to be. 
killing one of the most powerful and at the time divine demonic lords of the abyss and ruling his domain for five centuries is no small task. Heck, the mighty Roman Empire ruled atop the known world for a little over 500 years themselves, so not bad, Revenancer. Not bad at all. Thank you, fellow lore scholars, for giving me the opportunity to share today's lore, an endeavor only possible through your continued support. And a very special thank you to my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to support the channel as I attempt to keep the content sponsor-free, please check out the links below. Free Patreon memberships, free Discord access, and buy me a coffee donation link. And if you think I earned it, maybe like and subscribe. Thanks for listening, and until next time, remember, the only limitation at your table is your imagination.